You can come here. So they locked me in her. Come it's here. So sad. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> he's, he wants to be in here, and he wants. He doesn't to be want here. to be in here anyway. <laughs> there he goes. He's going to lay down and protect you. That's right. With his back to me. Anyway. Hey, friends, you're watching Brainstorm Makers. I'm Henry. And I'm Irene. We're going to talk about a couple of really quick topics today. <laughs> First of all, we did have a car accident a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Irene's thumb is still a little sore. Mm -hmm. Other than that, things seem to be fine. Yeah, I would say so. Except for one thing. Well, we don't have a car anymore. <laughs> that car is... Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, we got the message from the insurance company that after their evaluation... It wasn't worth fixing. It was going to cost more than $5,000 to repair a car that was worth $5,000. So, no, we're not going to repair the car. Right. Which means that... We have yet another thing to do that mm -hmm. requires us to be more than an hour away. Yeah. So we'll be doing that. Mm -hmm. At some point. We have vehicles we can drive. They just don't get as good a fuel mileage, which is a major consideration right now. And they're not something... Well, we have one that I'm per perfectly happy mm -hmm. putting on the road for long distance, but the others, yeah, they're okay, but they're kind of a rough to ride in because they're... Basically ranch trucks. Right. And, they, you know, they've got, like, you're bouncing down the road. And you're just like, oh, and dusty. And, I mean, you turn on the AC and the big pound of dust comes out. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Now, we've had a series of questions about what kind of seeds should be planted in our area. There are a lot of people moving into the high desert of northern Arizona and other similar spaces in the American Southwest. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are relatively new to gardening, or at least they're new to gardening in the high desert. So we've had one person ask some very pointed questions about what varieties should they grow. And in brief, growing in the high desert of northern Arizona is really no different than growing at sea level, let's say in Massachusetts or Maine or Virginia. It's a little rougher to grow because you have to be more concerned about things like water and wind and what the heat's going to be. Right. The big thing is, no matter where you live, when you're deciding what plants to plant, first of all, what do you like to eat? Don't plant something you don't like to eat unless you have a ironclad deal with a neighbor that you're going to trade with. How about a husband? Sure. What's he going to get me in exchange? <laughs> blink, blink, nod, nod, wink, blink. <laughs> Irene grows some things that I'm the only person who eats. For example, radishes and cucumbers. Right. I'm, I'm it. I'm the sole consumer of those products. And most of the time, I can keep up, but... Well, there have been times in the past when we had greater germination than we, or we thought we needed more pickles than we did, or whatever. So you need to be realistic, and that that that's no matter where. I mean, there's the standard jokes about people living in in uh, suburbia who grow zucchini, and they have they get rid of it by like going over, sneaking over to the neighbor's house, leaving it on the front porch, and running away before they can. <laughs> yeah, so the number one rule is grow things that you will eat, right. uh, unless you're just going to give them away to other people, in which case that's a whole different set of questions. Right. But grow things that you will eat. Now, there are plants that you can grow in the desert southwest that don't require a lot of water. I'm not going to say they don't require no water, yeah. because they do require water. Mm -hmm. For example, temporary beans, which we've grown before. Right. Some of the, some of the what, what's called dry land uh, pintos and things like that. These are beans that have been grown in the American Southwest for centuries in some cases. And thousand, uh, more than a thousand years in other cases. Yes. So these are native beans. There are some corns, there's the, things like that. But one of the things people say, oh, well, the, 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 um, the natives in south or southern Arizona grew these, so I should be able to grow them without any water. Uh, okay, first of all, they were not growing them in the summer. They were growing them in the winter in many cases. And so they were growing them in a more temperate climate at that time of year. And they had 
more warm water. water. A lot more water. The United, the United States in general, and especially the Southwest, has been undergoing a continuous drought or, or decline in water for 1,200 years at least. At least in the desert Southwest, yes. that's for sure. So that means that when the white folks got to Phoenix, water was only like 10 feet below the surface there. And the last time I checked in one area there, it's 150 feet below the surface. So where you've gone from a situation where you could hand dig a well, now you can no longer hand dig a well. It's hard to dig a well that's 150 feet deep by hand. So the environment in which these things were created means that they, they were very well adapted but the environment has changed. Yeah. So you can grow some of those ancient seeds, and we'll put a link in our show notes to at least one supplier of those seeds. We, Like I say, I, we've grown uh, temporary beans before. Mm -hmm. You can get beans, you can get squash, you can get corn, maize. It's really, it's not current corn. It's not what you would expect to buy it's at the grocery store. It's not sweet corn that you'd buy at the grocery store. Uh, for sure it's not sweet No, it was, a, it was designed to be ground into cornmeal and made into... Uh, things. Know, things, yes. So your first thing, obviously, is what do you like to eat? Second thing is how much do you need to grow? And this is really hard when you're getting started, even when you're not getting started. We've been growing for a long time, and every once in a while we still screw up and wind up with way too much of something. Or too little. Right. Now, last year we grew sweet onions, we grew candy and duster, and we are still eating last year's onions. Now, we will not have quite enough. We'll probably be a couple of months short of being able to have supplied our entire year worth of our onions, but that's not bad. Last year was the first year that we really tried to see if we could go an entire year. And part of it also becomes storage because you have to figure out what you're going to do with all this gigantic quantity. Can you keep it from spoiling? If it starts to spoil, what can you do with it to preserve it? That's all other things that you have to think about in the long run. Okay, I want to grow something. I decide on my vegetable. What am I going to do? Well, it would be a good idea to find out if you can grow that here. Most places in the United States, you can find some variety of almost any vegetable that you can grow. If you live like up by the Canadian border or in Canada, we have several friends in Canada who watch us, you're going to have to look at how long your grow season is. And you're going to have to accommodate that, possibly by stretching both ends. So you may need to start with a larger plant. You may need to be prepared to get it out, say for tomatoes in particular, to get them out into the garden really as soon as your soil is even sort of warm enough. You may need to preheat your soil by putting down plastic. You may need to use what they call wall of water, which is basically a portable greenhouse that you stick on individual plants. Yeah, it's pretty easy to do if, if, if you don't want to go spend money for a wall of water. You can get some one gallon milk jugs or juice jugs or things like that. Fill them with water and put them in the sun and put them around your plants. Right, and then cover then the cover whole thing it. with plastic. And that, will, that retention of heat will be enough to protect them from frost a lot of times. And you may wind up doing that at both ends of the season. Now, the problem with the fall end of that season is your plants are big and sprawly a lot of times by that time. So you may need to have some other kind of a row cover. So you're going to have to look and see how long your grow season is. If you have a 90-day grow season, planning to grow something that takes 120 days... Not, is a good, a, not a good plan. Very good formula for failure. Doesn't mean you can't do it. We had a fail last year. We were trying to grow Roselle. Now Roselle is a in the hibiscus family, and it produces a really gorgeous flower, just like a um, okra does. Very good for tea. I'm told you can brew with it, which I'm really intrigued by. Right. So this was something we really wanted to try. And then we found out later in the season that this does virtually nothing all season until the days start to get short. And then it kicks in and produces like crazy. Well, what happened to us was, and then it froze to death. Because by the time our days started to get short, it was too late in the season. Well, let's talk a little bit about your soil and your soil conditions. Mm -hmm. We talk with newcomers coming to the ranch that we live on, which is 200,000 acres, about 
you have to check your local soil conditions. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is we live, oh, about two and a half miles from the nearest asphalt. That's not the highway, that's just some asphalt road. If you look on one side, the north side of the road, you'll see black, what we call sugar cinders. That's from volcanic eruptions. Now, here we are just two and a half miles further to the east, and if you dig down a few feet, you run into gravel. Completely different growing conditions, completely mm -hmm. different soil. If you're down in a area where where water can wash in not too fast, you'll start collecting all the soil from upriver. Upriver, yeah, really. So you need to see what kind of soil you have. You're not guaranteed of one type or another. You have to look at your Varies area. Varies dramatically. The people north of I-40 here, uh, one of the guys we know up there who we did some work for us, he did some uh, tile laying and stuff for us years ago, he had to dig a trench because he was putting in water to his garage workshop area, and I remember looking at that trench, totally different stratigraphy. There were a lot of cinder cones up in that area, and the ground is littered with what they call bombs, geologically speaking. They're, they're rocks anywhere from tiny up to about that big and sometimes even bigger, but most of the ones in that area are about that big, that were thrown out of volcanics, uh, volcanoes and cinder cones when there was an eruption. His stratigraphy was just amazing. You could see all the different eruptions, reds and blacks and different colors. Down here, we don't get that at all. No. no we're all, um, what do you call it? Uh, we're not volcanic, volcanic here. We have some... Uh, in, our, ash, in our area. In, right, in our very local area. where we are. But we're all wash-in stuff. So we're, we're leftovers from when this was a inland sea. So... Within a mile or two of each other, you get these different spots. We see people down south um, near Benton and stuff like that, that they live in a giant sandbox. They want to drag a, drive a, stand, a, a pipe in, they could, they could do that with a mallet. You want to drive a pipe in around here, good luck. It's a lot The ground of is super hard, about anywhere from an inch or two below the surface to about three feet below the surface, depending on where you are will be a level of caliche, which is a calcium carbonate, unconsolidated limestone, but it's like working with soft concrete when you're banging through it. So you'll have wide variety in the soil type. There are people who are newcomers to this area who believe that they are experts when it comes to various topics relating to soil. Right. And the one thing that I can tell you is that what works five miles from where we live does not work here. Believe mm -hmm. me, we've tried all the techniques that people will talk about. We live in an area that has no topsoil. Mm -hmm. Or very little topsoil. But our neighbor has better topsoil than we do because he's farther down the hill than we are. So check to see what your soil type is because mm -hmm. that's going to control an awful lot of what you can do. Right. Now we're, everybody up here in northern Arizona with a few people who were smart enough, early enough to dig wells when it was cheap enough, mm -hmm. people are in water hall. And mm -hmm. why is that important? Well, if you look at the average garden space, you need to be putting one and a half gallons of water per week per square foot. So you start looking at having a row of, let's say, five tomato plants, and each tomato plant takes four square feet. Now you need to be looking at having 20 square feet of garden space, which if you live in an area that's all gravel or all cinders or all something that's not really productive, you need to have at least one and a half gallons of water per week. So you need to have 30 gallons of water a week plus. Right. Now that doesn't sound much to somebody who's on a regular spigot at home. But if you're hauling water 200 gallons at a time, which a lot of people around here do, think about it. That $200, water, uh, 200 gallons worth of water has got to cover drinking, washing, dishes. Oh, you might want to shower, uh, washing your hands, washing, you know, washing or watering the dogs, any other critters. Water becomes the stopping point. So, for instance, 
I've been talking to people about growing things like potatoes and sweet potatoes in 10 gallon buckets. That accomplishes multiple things. First of all, it allows you to create a microclimate where you are 100% in control of what dirt and soil goes in there. All your fertilizer goes in there. It doesn't dissipate out into the soil surrounding it. It can wash out the bottom if you overwater or if you had four inches in an hour, you're going to lose some out the bottom. But you can create this microclimate. It eliminates all the soil-borne pathogens. It eliminates a huge percentage of the bugs that might fly in and decide to lay larvae and stuff like that. You can actually control it by netting the top if you have to. So when we talk about that, we talk about controlling this microclimate. Great, I have to water that. And, and in addition to creating that microclimate, you also get to create an ideal soil structure in a small space so you don't have to spend a lot of money and a lot of time. Because believe me, when you try to create good tillable garden soil mm -hmm. here where we live, we've been at it for 17 years. And even by buying in organic material, we can barely keep up because mm -hmm. it just burns out so fast over well, the course of the year. I just, I just cleaned the asparagus bed because I'm a little behind this year. Usually I would have done it sometime in February, just didn't get to it. So I cleaned off the brush from last year, all the ferns, and I put down a good organic slow-release fertilizer, and then I top dress, and I used four bags of compost to top dress. Now, I can get away with only using four bags of compost for that because that was a built bed where the top foot was compost and other good quality soil to start with. And every day, every year, I try and put on about three inches of new compost every year, and it'll be pretty much gone by the end of the season because hot weather burns out the organics in your soil. Yeah, the microbes get a lot busier, which is good because they do a lot of beneficial things to your soil, but, but they use up the organics. Exactly.